Join Community Cats podcast for our annual online behavior day on Saturday, April 8th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time, featuring some of the animal welfare industry's most trusted authorities on feline behavior who will offer a variety of workshops on cat behavior concerns from vet visits and enrichment to litter box and multi-cat household issues. You not only learn about new concepts and tools you can incorporate into your home or rescue organization to address behavioral issues, but there will also be fun cat trivia and prizes to enhance your experience, as well as chances to network with other professionals and volunteers in the animal welfare sphere via our special online cat conference Facebook page. We have four fabulous presentations this year. We have Pam Johnson Bennett talking about how cats think. Then we have Tabitha Kusera, meowch, identifying pain and how pain contributes to behavior concerns. And then after lunch, we have Dr. Rachel Geller, play. It's not just fun and games. And then closing the day out, we have Arden Moore. What's eating you, cat? There's a small fee of $25, but you will have access to the recordings for up to a year. So if you can't make it, it's okay. You'll get access to the recordings and handouts. So join us by going to www.communitycatspodcast.com and turn your passion for cats into action. You've tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today I am thrilled for our 500th episode to have Dr. Jeff Young with us. Dr. Young graduated from Colorado State University School of Veterinary Medicine in 1989. He established Planned Pet Hood Plus in 1990. Planned Pet Hood Plus is best known for its low-cost mobile neutering services, Native American reservation work, and training of veterinarians from around the world in more efficient surgical techniques. Dr. Young has served on or consulted with numerous humane society boards nationally and internationally. He's founded his own nonprofit group called Planned Pethood International. Planned Pethood International was established to help fund spay neuter work and veterinary training involving numerous veterinary hospitals and veterinary schools around the world. PPI has a well-established international training center in Playa del Carmen, Mexico, offering free training for qualified candidates and having had hundreds of veterinarians and veterinary students come for hands-on training. Dr. Young is most proud of having personally sterilized over 185,000 animals in the last 32 years, and he is an outspoken proponent of early age neutering for companion animal population control. Dr. Young has the number one ranked TV show on Animal Planet called Dr. Jeff, Rocky Mountain Vet. He has used this platform to promote population control and basic medical needs for all companion animals. Dr. Young is driven by a simple underlying mission to significantly reduce companion animal overpopulation and suffering throughout the world. Think globally, act locally. Dr. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you, Stacey. So before we jump into lots of questions, I'm so excited to have you here for our 500th episode. I'm just, I'm just tickled. But first and foremost, all of our listeners want to know, how did you become passionate about cats? Well, I mean, in one sense, growing up, we always had dogs. We didn't have really cats. Uh, it wasn't until almost I was out of high school, we started having our first cat, which was a barn cat. But of course, had a litter, which of course, then we had to get them fixed and all that. And, and you know, that was kind of my first exposure to cats. It, on farms growing up, I spent some of the summers going to my grandparents' farms. They always had barn cats, but you could never touch them. They were always kind of semi-feral. So for me, I mean, in one sense, cats are, are kind of like, in some sense, the redheaded stepchild of, of, uh, of pets in a lot of ways because people either really like them or tend to really not like them. And I was kind of indifferent as a young male, but and, and young males are probably the worst when it comes to not liking cats for all kinds of psychological weird things, you know, in terms of whether it that uh, stuff, but ignoring all that, they're also the number one animal to be, to be, uh, to, for people to do cruel things to. I mean, you know, it, it, to be abused. I mean, cats by far uh, pick up a lot of slack there. I started liking them, and you know, when I started kind of, uh, 
running and doing other things in terms of athletic stuff. I just, they were incredibly ath- athletic to me. And that's what I think I, they're really appealing to me. Cats. I have two cats right now. We're only supposed to have one. We ended up with two, um, and, but they're just, they're just, they're pretty amazing. And I guess um, I can't see myself not having a cat and a dog in my life. I can, I can take the, the dog running. I can't really take the cat running. <laughs> Although some cats are, can do some pretty amazing things, but uh, I don't, I don't see my household without a cat at this point in my life. I really don't. I, and I, I just really appreciate, I, I kind of like the fact that they have that kind of like, uh, I'm going to ignore you attitude, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things are on their term. Cause I, you know, I just, I appreciate their attitude about life, I guess. You know, and, and they're they're quite content to lay in the sun and, and relax, and and that's definitely not me, but I, I appreciate it in them. So you have assisted 185,000 animals, you know, over the last 30 ish years. We were just both saying we've been around for a while in the <laughs> yeah. animal welfare space. You see both dogs and cats. What do you see as the challenges, you know, between the different two different breeds? What are the challenges for cats in the animal welfare space? What are the challenges for dogs? Well, uh, it's pretty simple. The problem is one thing: we don't have stray dogs per se in America. And you know, some places in the south there's some issues, but overall we have a lot of stray cats. We don't have stray dogs, you know, and we have a very developed animal control in most places. Now, you know. Uh, well, cats can reproduce 45 times faster than humans. All right. So dogs are only 15 times. So, you know, I've, I've, you know, over seven years, cats, you know, they're, them and their offspring, a male and female can produce 50,000 cats. Everybody's seen the pyramid, you know, for cats. So that that's one thing different about dogs and cats. Uh, they are totally different creatures, you know, and that's as veterinarians, we're, we're not necessarily taught much about behavior and as far as i'm concerned the best people with behavior when it comes to cats would would be cat protection out of england you can google them the cat protection i mean they know everything there is you know like we've really gone to like big catteries and stuff and they've gone away from that because it's really not in the interest of the cats from stress standpoint from underlying uh, diseases cats get really bizarre diseases you know unlike dogs dog diseases are pretty straightforward cat diseases are not straightforward and they can be multiple at the same time and uh, they manifest in many ways. And I think stress in cats is a lot different than stress than dogs. So they're much harder to read and and the, their ability, like right now we know that 90% of cat litters are not planned. You know, we're only like 30, 40% of dog litters aren't planned. So, you know, we have a better uh, grip on dogs. We know when they come to heat and those kind of things and cats, are really good at reproducing really fast. So there's just, those are I say, I'm the biggest differences. In our shelters, cats are euthanized at a much higher rate. You're much more likely, less likely to adopt a cat than a dog from a shelter. But you think about it, like I always say, well, you know, it comes back to the value of the animal to some degree, which is kind of a supply and demand kind of thing. Like if my cat dies, I can literally walk outside and literally walk around the neighborhood and I can probably pick up a cat, you know, <laughs> or find a kid, a stray kitten, you know. So yeah, you can't do that with dogs. So, you know, does that make the dog more valuable? Does that make the cat more valuable? You know what I mean? I don't, people are less likely to spend money on major procedures for cats, you know? So they really are perceived as the redheaded stepchild. And um, to me, that's really disturbing because if they're a domesticated animal and it's Felis domesticus, they're very much a domesticated animal. Uh, we should be putting the same amount of energy into them and, and trying to save as many of their lives as we possibly can as we do with dogs. And we've done a good job with dogs. We don't see cats is the same threat as dogs in terms of bites and things like that because cats will just go away from you where dogs don't always do that right yeah i i definitely think one of the big differences is between the behavior challenges sort of in the dog side of things i think there's a lot of issues there that i don't even know the tip of the iceberg on those issues versus cats where it seems in my world you know, let's just focus on some basic care that those cats need. And they need access to the spay neuter in an affordable environment, because I feel that a lot of folks, they can't even afford $75, $100 for a spay or neuter. If you're talking, you've got 10 cats in the backyard that you're trying to get spayed or neutered for, for TNR, or say you get a mom in and they've got kittens and they're trying to get the kittens spayed and neutered before you give them to the neighbors in the neighborhood or whatever, which, you know, ideally we want everybody to get spayed and neutered before they're they're handed out. In your practice, what age do you do spay and neuter for cats? Well, we are on board with the fix by five 
So in our practice, you know, we like to get them vaccinated, dewormed, all those kind of things, maybe tested, you know, depend on what the, the owners want. Uh, but in the end, fixed by five is five months, not five years. <laughs> That's the big thing. But, you know, when we travel, we do animals as young as five weeks with cats. And, and, and I lecture on this all around the world, but cats, there is no age difference. I mean, it doesn't matter. There's no long-term science that indicates anything bad with you do them, you know, at, at five weeks or five months or, you know, necessarily well, five years or some things with memory tumors. But in the end, there's no early age issues. With some dogs, some giant breeds, there's starting to be some literature this literature is still shaky on the dogs, but in the end, we're, I think even the AVMA is on board with fixed by five months for cats. So I think that's a big, big thing. And if you get them by five months, they don't tend to have litters. And understand, once again, cats can just reproduce so fast. And it's like you say, I'll go to call and say, well, you know, my, my mom took in a cat, didn't get it fixed. Now we have 30 cats, you know. Well, you know, I mean, at, from that point, they have no chance of getting those animals fixed through a re regular veterinarian. It's just not going to happen, you know, and they're so common. Uh, it's just, it's a real problem. Oh, for sure. Definitely. And one thing that I found over the years in working with some of the private practice veterinarians that that we had to work with before our shelter had our mobile spay-neuter clinic, the Catmobile, we would work with the private practice veterinarians and they didn't realize how easy it was on kittens, when they would get spayed and neutered. And, and, you know, we would get them a couple hours later, they'd be beating each other up in the cage right afterwards, right? Yeah. And they're like, oh, wow, this is so great. The cat's not wiped out for days, right? Right back to normal. It's absolutely amazing. There's just there's just no issue with it, and you, they just don't die. They don't. You don't have a, a, a the death rate's not the same, and it should be low anyway. But it not, you know things do happen. I think the biggest thing with cats is that a lot of people aren't are more reluctant to spend money in terms of blood and stuff like that. You know, so like with a lot of dogs, we do blood work ahead of time. You know, before we do spay and neuter. Well, a lot of cats, and especially feral cats, you don't have those options. You know, so when you consider that perspective, the few that actually we have problems with, it's pretty phenomenal because you latch them, you're doing some pretty skanky animals, you know, that are out there in the wild and yet they survive, you know, they, they do amazing as well. How comfortable are the folks at your clinic and, and what is your impression sort of with uh, the general practice veterinarians or the veterinarians that you know of? How comfortable are veterinarians in handling community cats in traps? Yeah, that I think that's a real problem. I think it's not worth it to a lot of veterinarians, especially for a lower rate, you know. And so, yeah, I, I think that's a big obstacle we got to overcome because in the end, like – they really want to do a TPR on it. They really want to get their hand. Well, you know, it's in a cage and if you're not going to let it out of that cage, you know, so, um, and you're guessing weights and all these kind of things, you know, so it, once you get used to it, I think that's it. Get on board with it. Get really good at it really fast. And, and on, on, in all honesty, a cat space should be less than 10 minutes. You know, a cat neuter should be less than two minutes. You know, it takes me about 30 seconds to neuter a male cat. It takes me about six, five or six minutes to spay a female cat. You know, on, on average, you know, you always have exceptions to all rules. But in the end, they're just, they're really quick. Uh, they can be very efficient if you get good at them. And so I, I love doing cat space and neuters, you know, but uh, a lot of vets are still reluctant to deal with ferals and not to be malign anybody. But part of it is the people they have to deal with to bring in the ferals, you know, because they, I don't know, it's things like, well, if it's, if the cat's pregnant, sew it back up, don't spay and neuter it, you know, those kind of things. And it's like, well, that's not what we do. It's a feral cat. We're going to spay it because we know 80% of kittens die in the first four months of life in the wild. And while, you know, we're not going to sit there and put this cat in a room and have it have babies and then have them nurse for two weeks and then put the cat back out and take the baby. It, it, it's not cost effective. It's not, it's not logical. So, and I think that's where some of the real strong personalities on the cat side create problems. They create their own problems in some ways, you know, and we got to find that balance. Right. One thing I have on my website, it's called the Community Cat Pyramid. And ideally, I would love to get all the cats spayed and neutered before something happens that makes them live outdoors all the time. Sure. So, and I always, those are my Adam and Eve cats. There's Adam in one house and Eve in the other. And obviously, we'd like to make sure that those families or however they're sourced get spayed and neutered before something happens and it, and it gets them outside. However, then we're dealing with the reactive issue of TNR for those that didn't get spayed and neutered while they're while they're out there. And it, it provides us with a whole basket of challenges. And as you say, you're dealing with the people who yeah. are bringing the cats in and that they need to have a lot of communication and upfront protocol. However, we're faced with a lot of challenges these days because we have what's called the veterinary shortage out there. And we also have 
so we have we're approaching our private practice veterinarians. We're asking if they're willing to help, and, and you know everybody is stressed out. They're overwhelmed, and then and and you've talked about some training too. So in this whole basket of we have this veterinary shortage, you've got these fast spay neuter techniques. You've developed a training program. You know how can we improve the situation? Well, I mean, that's one of the things that we're, we've just sold our building that we're in now in, in Wheat Ridge, and we're going to move up to Conifer. It's only about 30 minutes away, but it has, it's 6,000 square feet below and 6,000 square feet above. So our footprint in the veterinary side is going to be a little bit smaller. We're about, about 7,000 down here, but we're hoping to be more efficient. We have a, tr- we've set up a whole new training room. My goal, we've worked with six different uh, vet schools right now. My goal is to get that up to like 26 different vet schools. Uh, but it, those students that come through, they, I mean, they, they give us a write up and they say, you know, they get more experience in a few weeks or less than they do through their whole, you know, their whole time at vet school. Uh, and most of them have given us really, you know, five star glowing reviews because we really get them into the mix and make them do the work. Now we're supervising everything. And, and at the same time, so they're so, you're so limited to what you get when you come out of school. So I think to, for me at this point, at, you know, at my age, getting close to retirement, although I say my retirement is death, but uh, you know, I want to keep doing surgery as long as my hands and my eyes work out, my back holds up. Um, but if I can train people to do those things, and that's what they have to feel comfortable. They know a cat space is not going to take them an hour to do that kind of thing, you know. Uh, and once they get confident in those things, they're more likely to do it. And you know, and I don't know, they're going to go work for some private practitioner, and maybe he's going to say, no, we don't want to deal with that. But the point is, the seed's been planted, and they're and at some point, hopefully, they'll end up be in a position to help more people. You know, and with cats in particular, it really is. It's a neglect on society is why we have these cat problems. Because I'm sorry, no cat should go outside before it's fixed, period. I don't. I think cats should stay inside, period, anyway, for the most part, depending on where you live and if you have a cattery or, you know, some a, a cat that's least trained. There's, exa- you know, there's, there's exceptions to all rules. But for the most part, there's just no rationale for an animal to be outside that's intact for a cat because, you know, they, they can revert to the wild real quick and become feral. Uh, and it doesn't take much for them to do that, you know, because they're not fully domesticated the way dogs are. So the training program that that you're uh, putting together and launching, how long is that? How long do the students stay there? It varies. Uh, most of them get two weeks to six to th- three weeks, um, you know, depending on the university they go to. But sometimes they get they come back for a second two or three weeks, you know. And I, the one girl that came from the University of Florida, I mean, she was doing cat spays, you know, by the end of the second week by her, uh, on her own in dog neuters and not dog spays yet. But, you know, we kind of work up to things. But, you know, I mean, we're obviously there. And I always tell, you know, no matter what you do. I can correct it. I can fix it. No matter what you cut, as long as you don't, as you don't cut the heart in half or something, you know, I can, I can repair any damage you do, you know, and, and, and I really believe that for the most part, because soft tissue, you weird things, um, like maybe they pull an ovary out and it's bleeding, you know, so you just teach them to open up, you know, be calm about it, open up, clamp it, tie it, no big deal, you know. So they get off midline and may bleed a little bit more. That's normal. It's okay. You know, just finish it out. So it's it's pretty amazing how the, the young students are really freaked out from blood. And and I'm just not freaked out from blood anymore. So I know what I can get away with, I guess. You know, you don't like the extra bleeding, but if you happen to do, you know, something messes up, then you take care of it, you know. And I guess the point. And they really do well. I mean, uh, I mean, animals, cats in particular, I mean, they bounce right up. And it's if they lay around the next day after a spay neuter, it's almost always from the vaccines. That's the first thing. Did they get the vaccines? Yep. Oh, that's going to be a little bit of a vaccine. That's like kids, you know. I mean, so you will get some to lay around, but it's never from the spay or neuter. It just doesn't happen that way. Do you want to make things easier on yourself and the others in your organization? Our friends at Dubert have teamed up with the Dallas Pets Alive and Spay Neuter Network teams, and together they have created the Companion Case Management Module. It allows you to be more proactive with all your organization's needs, create cases for your clients and organize them by type. Whether it is a rehoming situation, a pet parent needing food or medical assistance, or simply spay and neuter inquiries, CCM can help you manage all of them right from the Dubert system. Plus a huge bonus, it allows you to connect with those clients right from the case so there is no need to open up new windows for emails or pull out your phone for text messages. Check it out and learn more at www.dubert.com to get started today. Ever wanted to quickly connect, collaborate, or problem solve with others in the animal welfare field who are, you know, real people? Look no further than Maddie's Pet Forum. 
Batty's Pet Forum brings people of animal welfare together with the common goal to keep more people and pets together. We share ideas, expertise, offer each other support, resources, and more. Visit forum.maddiespetforum.org slash cats. Maddie's Pet Forum, come for an answer, stay for the community. I followed your social media a little bit and, you know, you've talked a little bit about the stress that veterinarians, the technicians, just the whole industry is feeling a lot of emotional stress. How do you process it? How do you take care of it? How are you able to show up every day? Uh, I ask myself that every day. I'm like, uh, my back's killing me this morning. I can barely walk this morning when I got out of bed. I normally get up and I, you know, I'm up pretty early in the morning. I'm usually running by 6.30. I go out for you know, a two, three, four mile jog. Then I go come back here, put in 30, 40 minutes, uh, social media, whatever. And then I go to my sensei uh, to a dojo and work out, li- uh, lifting. Sometimes we do some shadow boxing or fighting or hitting a heavy bag. So I think hitting things helps a lot. <laughs> but in the end, I, I just... I don't know. You know, like, I'll be honest, I make about $125,000 a year. And for 34 years experience, I can do anything soft tissue wise in, in, in terms of cardiac surgeries, you name it, anything, you know, uh, and I can do a lot of knee surgeries, hip surgeries. You know, there's not a whole lot I can't do. I could easily be making 350000 and working half the number of hours I work, you know, but I think that's what's wrong with our profession, you know, it, and I understand that young kids that have debt, they, they want more money. I get that. And they need it because college is so expensive. But ignoring that fact, in the end, doing things for huge amounts of money where half the animals that come in, you send out or you'll euthanize them because, you can't, you know, they don't have the money. I, I, that cannot be, to me, that's the stressor. You know, I get to make people smile and help people every day, no matter how much my back hurts. At least I feel good about what I do. Now, imagine you don't necessarily feel good uh, about what you do. And then you have all these financial pressures and everything else. I, you know, I mean, I understand why we have such a high, you know, suicide rate. And we have one of the highest in the nation as veterinarians. But, you know, you think about 89 was the year I graduated. It was the first year there was more females than males in, in my in at Colorado State. And now there's about 95, 96 percent females in every vet school. And in one sense, to me, I even said then this is going to drive compassion into the profession because there wasn't much, you know, and leg hold traps were not cruel and inhumane. And now they are things like that, you know, but with that compassion also comes that burnout, you know, because once again, as prices have gone up and only about 40% of Americans can afford current, current veterinary prices, 40%, that means 60% can't, but there are more people, more people have pets and have kids, you know? And so those people are, they neglect their animal, not because they want to neglect their animal, because they can't afford not to. And, and that's, to me, is a horrible, and then you take it to the vet and they go, well, we want a thousand dollars for, you know, it's a, a single mom on a, or an elderly person on a fixed income or a single mom. We want a thousand dollars for a dental, you know? And it's like, well, I don't have that. So I just let my cat's animal teeth just rot, you know, uh, and that leads to kidney disease. And OK, well, now I can't treat the kidney. Let's put him to sleep, you know. Um, and that's kind of to me, that's just it's a we've missed something in this country in that respect. We've missed a lot. you know. Yeah. And I've heard a phrase instead of compassion fatigue, there's moral distress, which yeah. is a, another phrase, which is, you know, the, we know what we could do, but we can't because of these obstacles. Absolutely. And that's the one thing. I mean, I'm, I had 11 vets. I'm down to, to, to two and a half and uh, I could hire three or four tomorrow. But the truth is like one of my, one of my most current hires who's been with us for about two years and she's become pretty solid, but she said, look, you know, the truth is I can work two or three days a week and make more than, than, you know, what I'm paying her, you know? And, and I understand that, you know, I, I mean, my, my wife does TPLOs and things. She could work doing one or two TPOs so we can make more than what I can pay her because we're a nonprofit, you know, um, and she makes about the same amount of money. But I can't I can't do much more than about one hundred twenty five thousand per year, which to me is plenty of money. I'll, I'll be honest, you know, but and I have quite a bit of debt. But, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm comfortable with that, you know, and I, would I like to make three hundred thousand? Sure. But I don't want to change what I do, because if I do that, then I know I'm not helping the people I have vowed to help. And I, I don't, I don't know how we change that, but it's a dog chasing its tail in one sense because it's this is not sustainable. You cannot hire new grads for one hundred sixty five thousand coming out of school who cannot return that money back to you. There's no way they can for the first year or two and a half times they don't get to do surgeries and things like that. 
But since Wall Street has gotten involved in buying so many clinics and because of the shortage of veterinarians, there's a bidding war because they would rather, you know, they, they, I mean, you know, and you think about it, as soon as you get Wall Street involved and you buy a clinic, make it corporate, well, you have, you have, shareholders that have to get paid. You have a bureaucracy, you know, a, a bureaucrats that have to be paid. So everything is doubled right right away, you know, to pay for things and just the way it is. And that's what's happened. You know, we've just seen this big increase in Wall Street get involved in terms of buying clinics, you know, uh, and, and I'm all for competition, but there's no competition. It, it, they're, you know, they're just everybody's just raising their prices and then they get a vet in the in the doors. They'll offer them ungodly amounts of money to do it because they have to have a body, period. You know, it doesn't matter how good the body is as long as they have a body. You know, so I don't I, I don't see it as being sustainable. I, I don't know when it changes and when we're going to get back to maybe my neighbor does care a little bit. And, and maybe we should think about society uh, from a broader perspective than just ourselves. But obviously in the current political environment, maybe that's not going to happen either. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I I do think there are a couple of issues, at least from my perspective on cats is, you know, understanding that our pets are not property, but yet they're part of the family. So sort of a legal representation of them, giving them a higher rating, higher than, you know, my couch in the living room right now, legally in some states, the couch and the cat are the same. And and therefore, if we we raise that level for cats to a different legal status, I think that will help on a on a long term framework. And I also think on the short term, utilizing our veterinarians, at least from the nonprofit perspective, I'm wearing my nonprofit hat here is really making sure that the veterinarians are their time is being used specifically for veterinarian need, even if it means taking that management any management stuff, like as much off the plate, you know, the front facing whose relationship is with the client. I understand the veterinarian, there is some connection there with the veterinarian, but maybe have the technician be more of that case manager, the liaison, the lead. And I know there's a huge, there's a, there's a shortage of technicians too. So we have to kind of address that issue and raise their level up too. So there's, it's a multi-pronged situation, but, you know, I think it would be really great if our technicians could be doing more at a higher level and then helping to support veterinarians and also be the contact with the community. No, and you know, and it's, it's tough, but I, I think there should be spay neuter techs. I really do for the basic stuff. You know uh, I don't see it happening anytime soon. I, at one point we tried to pat, they tried to pass a law um, that made cats and dogs, a special type of personal property. And you could be sued as a veterinarian for up to $10,000 if you malpractice. And I'm telling here to tell you, I must've got that was back in the day of faxes. I must've got like a hundred faxes in about two day period saying we have to kill this law. It's going to put us out of business. Everyone's going to be suing us all the time. And it's just not the case that, that, you know, and my thing is like, but, and we were still charging $5,000 back then for some basic bone surgeries and stuff. And they, but how can you say an animal's worth $5,000 but yet, if you malpractice screw up, you don't have to pay anything. But, you know, because it's a personal property thing, it's what's the value of a neutered cat? OK, $1.95. OK, here we're even Dubai. You know, I mean, I just it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, it's like, well, you can't have it. And the vet professionals ha- ha- wants it both ways. We want to we want to be able to charge you rates that we feel like we're worth. But then if we mess up or something happens, we don't want the consequences of that. You know, I, you know, I, I don't know. It makes it to me, it's unethical. It's not moral and it, it's wrong, you know, and you can't have it both ways. And we've had it both ways for quite a while. Now, people are very much in their animals, even more so than in the past. And they are more likely to, to ask questions and, you know, come in with Dr. Google, and <laughs> you know, those kind of things and, and question you, you know, um, and, and I don't, you know, I'm not sure what the answer is for all that, you know, because we don't have insurance, you know, on the human side, you have insurance, but I mean, in all honesty, in America, let's face it, not everyone has the same caliber of insurance as everybody else. Not everybody has health insurance, you know, so we haven't even done that with our humans. So why we think we're going to do it to our animals, you know? What are your thoughts about spay neuter deserts, sort of areas of the country where they're, it's really even just hard to even find a veterinarian. You mean the South? <laughs> the South. And, you know, I, I, I know there have been studies around the country of sort of, you know, how you can access veterinary care and other things. I mean, are we at a point where we need to strategically look at that? Oh, yeah. No, I, I mean, 
I see consistently, which is once again drives me nuts, but people will like collect dogs and cats from Louisiana and take them up to New York or whatever, you know. And we have people that fly animals. I do work in Romania, from Romania to California, and they adopt dogs in California. And they they adopt like hotcakes because they have a story, right? Well, you know, L.A. and San Diego have some of the highest euthanasia rates in the nation, yet. So, so, you know, like there's animals everywhere, you know, you don't need to be moving them. But a lot of the group, because they don't necessarily have access to veterinarians or good veterinary care, they just transport animals. Well, transporting an animal doesn't work if, if it be dog or cats, because in the end, they're still back there reproducing. And we know there's many areas that, you know, where up to 70 percent of the animals never, up to 76 percent animals never see a veterinarian in their lifetime. And 87 percent are not fixed. Now, you think about that. So they're not fixed. You're taking animals out of whatever that area is, and all they do is keep reproducing, you know, and and dying and having diseases. So, you know, and I understand the feeling it gives you, and God knows I've transported a few animals from time to time, but it's rare. I mean, and people contact me all the time, you know, about bringing animals across borders and this kind of thing. And it's a big thing in Europe right now with the European Union because they're actually seeing diseases because of of climate change, they're seeing diseases like leishmaniasis, which is zoonotic, go into countries it never had before, you know. So these things are not without big implications in terms of movement of diseases and stuff. And there's moral implications, you know, of the amount of money you spent, you know, like going to reservations. Oh, we have res dogs, you know, we can adopt animals, you know, off the res. Great. But if you're not spaying and neutering, how, when does it end? When when does it ever end? You know, I, I, it never. And I don't see how that makes a real difference in the long run. And that, to me, that's what I've always tried to make a difference. I want to believe I make a difference in the long run. So, Dr. Jeff, I'm going to give you the magic community cats wand. If you could do whatever you wanted to do to help community cats what would be the most important thing that you would create for them? A simple mo- mobile spay neuter with enough money to be able to go to, to the little lady's house on a farm that has 40 cats in the barn and trap everyone in spay neuter. I mean, that's the only way you're going to stop this because unfortunately we created this mess by letting our animals out that were not fixed. Uh, we know in, in one study of 100,000 uh, feral cats, only less than 3% were already fixed. You know, so we know by fixing animals, they don't go out and join colonies. They don't start colonies. You know, that's what unfixed animals do. You know, they revert back to the wild. So we have to get to those animals. We know that over 60% of kittens in the spring come from usually stray or feral moms, you know. So the only way to really increase the value of the cat is decrease the supply. And the only way to decrease the supply is go to the problem areas. Yep. And I would say, you know, it's going back to basics and really looking at spay neuter as our critical primary focus on our efforts, our programs as nonprofits is really looking at spay neuter what are we providing our community if we can't provide spay neuter to the community we're not going to be impactful yeah no i know i've lectured on this all over the world i say you know any humane group in the 21st century if you do not have an active feral cat you know uh, trap and release program you're not doing your job i'm sorry you know because just collecting animals or or killing animals or ignoring animals is not the answer this is the 21st century i'm sorry you can do better we can do better believe you 100 percent. i'm with you on it that's for sure if folks are interested in finding out more about the work that you do um how would they do that well plan pitted plan pitted international.org we're on facebook under plan pitted international i'm under i i do a lot of stuff on instagram under jeffrey young so and we're just Try, we, we, I have a new YouTube channel, so we're going to start posting some videos and stuff on that. So most are dog-oriented, but some will be cat-oriented. Um, it just it, It's all new to us. So, uh, you know, I lecture all over the world, so we'll be putting some of our lectures on there from time to time. And that involves overpopulation. Most of the problems around the country, is it's weird. You go into a country, it's always dog, you know, street dogs initially. But as you drop the street dogs, guess what? You got cats. <laughs> you know, the cat population goes. So they have to be addressed simultaneously, you know. So, uh, so yeah, those, uh, yeah, those are the best ways. That to get a hold of us. So planpitternational.org. Excellent. Excellent. When you get rid of the cats, then the rats come up too. Oh, absolutely. And that's been proven over and over. I say it has to do with carrying capacity to land. In the end, everything has to be addressed because if it's not, you just create other problems. You just shift problems, you know. Yeah. And and I'd say governments are not very good at addressing long-term issues like that, but uh, activists can be. Yeah. When I've gone in to talk to various leaders in Department of Health 
the first thing that they will say to me now in New England, I'm in New England. So TNR has been, you know, popular for a long time. First question out of their mouths now is, you know, tell me about the rats. We understand what you're going to do about the cats. We've got it. But now, now what do we do about the rats? That's always their next question. So for folks in areas, when you do get those cat population under control and they start dying out, then the rats are going to, are the, are the next issue, unfortunately. There's always something. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> there is always something. Dr. Jeff, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today on this 500th uh, episode? No, no, just please, please, if you have a cat, get a spayed or neutered. And if it's not spayed or neutered yet, don't let it out for a second until you do get a spayed or neutered. I think that's the most important thing we can do. It, it buys them three to five years on average uh, in terms of extra life. So it's the most important thing you can do to your cat. Excellent. And I did have a blog post, a blog post I never thought I would ever write, which was how to keep a female unspayed cat and an unneutered male cat apart and somewhat happy in a house while you were waiting three months for your vet appointment. You know, because I've run into so many people who are like, well, I've, I, I need to go with a lower income, a low cost program, but the wait list is so long. It's May. I can't get in until October. I hear you. Yeah. And so I'm like, well, but keep them inside, you know, but they're going to spray all over, you know, the male cats can spray all over the place, female cat, you know, so I talked to breeders, I was talking to yeah. breeders, how do you live with this on a daily basis? Because, you know, just even if a few people do it, I figure it's a couple litters saved, right? It is. In the end, I think if you really are into helping animals, know where you donate your money. You know, and bottom line is make more demands. We don't demand stuff that we should. You know, we just assume, oh, it's a nice place. They adopt me a cat or they adopted a dog to me, you know, but what are they doing? What are they doing so they don't have to adopt? You know, so shelters become shelters where it's an emergency. Someone died in a family. No one wants that animal. So it ends up at a shelter or there's a tornado or flood. So it ends up at the shelter. That's what a shelter is for, not for for them to go collect animals to redistribute. You know, that's not what it should be. You know, and we, we have control over that. We, if we vote with our money and give our money to the right groups or demand and say, why aren't you doing this? You know, why haven't you opened a, a low cost spay neuter clinic? I think we can get, we get them to change. I really do. Excellent. Excellent advice. Dr. Jeff, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. And I hope we'll have you on again in the future. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Stacey. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think. And a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats.